Welcome to Uriah Heep, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and I am taking you on a journey back. We're revisiting songs that have been covered by this podcast where I had guests on, and now I'm covering them solo because it'll give a different perspective and I'm in a different moment. I'll hear things I didn't hear and talk about things I didn't talk about, maybe repeat some of the same things I said in the first episode. I have no idea because I didn't go back and listen to them. However, before we start, it is Monday. Welcome to Monday. I hope you guys all had a great weekend. There's some people I want to thank. I want to thank Cakewalk by BandLab, Podbean, and people who have left iTunes reviews. I want to thank my graphic artist, Scott Lazinski, for the wonderful logos. Also did the covers for my book series, The Universal Court, and my third and final What Happened in Vegas book. Uh, very excited. He did such an amazing job on all those. Thank you very much, Scott. I want to also thank Audionamics, Isotope, Waves, and Sonatus, which are all tools that I use to put this podcast together. I do have a tutorial on how to do podcasts on YouTube. You can go to my YouTube channel and check that out. Uh, there's a handful of videos there. I've changed the process slightly, but not enough to uh, really need to redo the videos. Uh, if it changes drastically, I probably will do that. And also, of course, the one and only director of social media for Uriah Heap, who is great at spreading the word about the show, uh, announcing all the Uriah Heap things. He manages the website and the Twitter account, uh, Dave White, folks. He also manages uh, mick-box.net. And the Uriah Heap official website is uriah Heap. Com. And of course, uh, we are still working hard to get Uriah Heep into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, finally. Um, as of the time that I'm recording this, we're just about 490 signatures short on the petition. You can go to my website, scotthaskin.com, click on the Uriah Heep uh, podcast link, and from there you will see the link to sign the petition. If you haven't already done so, please do. And if you have already done so or haven't, please share that with other folks who uh, you know who like Uriah Heep so that we can get this knocked out and get them in there once and for all. And then you can stop hearing me talk about it. Uh, Then I will just say like a huge thank you and that'll be that. Uh, Also, before we start the episode, uh, it is Monday. I want to give a quick shout out to all of my brothers and sister at the Deep Dive Podcast Network. We have Terry T-Bone Mathley at T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the other side, Nate and John at the Deep Purple Podcast, The Simple Man at Skinnered Reconsidered, Rye at Sabbath Bloody Podcast, Paul, Joe, and David at In the Lap of the Pods, Andy and Matt at Hawk Binge, Eric and Jonathan at Maiden A to Z Pod, Daniel and Josh at Diary of the Mad Men, The Ultimate Aussie Podcast, Ben and Sam at Universally Speaking, The Red Hot Chili Pepper Podcast, George and Hattie at Judas Priestcast. There was a different name for that. It is now the Judas Priestcast, and uh, the hosts have changed. Hattie has joined, and it is now George and Hattie doing that show. Great job. Uh, we also have Mark and Corey at And the Podcast Will Rock, our Van Halen podcast. John, Corey, and myself at Backtracks Aerosmith Revisited. I have joined that podcast as a co-host, having a great time with uh, with John and Corey over there. John and Corey also do another show that I've guested on a couple times, Backtracks Theme Music, going into music that is the theme for films. Fantastic show. Clay and Rye at North by South. Greg and Jonathan at So Far, So Pod, So What? a Megadeth podcast, Kevin at the Tom Petty Project, Quinn at And Volume for All, Sav, Nick, John, and Mark at the Rock Roulette Podcast. All of these podcast links can be found on the website. Again, go to scotthaskin.com, click on the Uriah Heat Podcast link, and all the way down at the bottom is the links for the Deep Dive Podcast Network, also located in the show notes. And of course, my buddy Brandon at Metallicast, and our friend over at gottahearemall.com. Lastly, we have Louder with Ace over on Stitcher and YouTube. Ace is Uriah Heap's manager. He is also McBox's manager, has a lot of amazing information about uh, just various things in the music business from his insider perspective. Very knowledgeable, very well-spoken, a great show to check out. Uh, Also, we have a couple members are on Cameo, so go ahead and check that out. You can hire these guys to do a video for you. 
How cool is that? Uh, they're not all on Cameo, but some of them are. So just go to Cameo, look up Uriah Heap. You can also, again, go to my website and all the links, uh, the most current ones that I have are there on the website. So all that being out of the way, today we are re-diving into the song I Won't Mind from the album Wonder World. And uh, just to give a quick refresher on who the players are on this song, once again, it's the same lineup we've had. Lead vocals, David Byron, guitar, Mick Box, bass, Gary Thane, drums, Lee Kerslake, and keys, Ken Hensley. Hell of a lineup. Absolutely hell of a lineup. So let's dig into I Won't Mind. Now, I did forget to mention when I did this show the first time, it was Brandon from Metallicast that was the guest. We had to break it into four parts because that's just what happens when Brandon and I get together. We did a um, an episode of my other podcast, the Haskincast podcast, over uh, Metallica's Ride the Lightning, and I think that one turned into a four-part episode as well. It just happens when you get two people having a great conversation about some incredible art. It happened here, it happened there, and Brandon's a great guy, so I, I did not mind one bit whatsoever. Uh, this song is really cool. You know, it's it's really patient. It starts out with just a very solid, slow build, and I love the bass sound on this. I don't I don't think it's a fretless bass. It might have been a fretless bass, but it does. It definitely has a, a tone to it, like a little bit of flange maybe is on it. Um, I really dig the sound, though. It's a nice balance, too, between drums and bass at this point. Um, I hear some guitars going to come in, so let's see where it goes. That is some really adventurous playing. I like that. It, it's, you know, there's a lot of techniques being used here. I like the sound of the guitar, too. It's kind of a little bit distant, a little bit echoey. It's it's definitely not right up in your face, but it has a certain feel to it. And, and there's, I'm trying to think of what song it was by Frank Zappa that had a similar guitar tone. I want to say it was Fembot in a white t-shirt, but I'm not positive but there was it was something on that album, and it had a similar guitar tone to this, and it had that same kind of delay on it too. Uh, but really cool, I really like this. It, it's it, there's a lot of, um, like I said, a lot of different techniques, some places that you kind of just don't feel it's going to jump from from one place to another. So there's some really nice surprises in that. Definitely dig that. You don't expect a drum beat to change, but I like that it does. I think that's pretty cool. It's I like when things are unexpected because you kind of get the idea that this is going to be a pretty straightforward song. Maybe there's going to be a couple of changes in it, but for the most part, you would imagine the verse uh, would, would be more straightforward and not have a doubled beat like that. So uh, again, you know, these guys are full of surprises and that's uh, that's a nice one. I'd forgotten about that. One really nice thing about a musical structure like this is it really gives a lot of opportunity for solos, whether you're just doing fillers in between a, a, you know lines in a verse or chorus, or you know, you're going to have a, a nice little solo section like this before the next verse starts again. It, it certainly leaves a lot of open room on the canvas to paint. And uh, I, I like that they took advantage of that. That was cool. Again, great playing on the guitar. 
Um, I really like the sound. This, this definitely feels very studio recorded, though. There, it doesn't feel live at all. Um, I'm, I'm not talking from a playing perspective. I mean, just from like a tonality standpoint, it definitely sounds like it was recorded in a studio with nice padding and a, a fairly dead room. Um, I think they could have added a little bit more reverb to make the whole thing sound a little bit more alive, especially on the drums. They feel a little bit dry. But um, yeah, I like the song. The performance is great. I mean, I've said it so many times. These guys are definitely the kings of transition. That was a really nice intro of the organ. I actually thought that that might be a timpani roll. Um, the way that it kind of came in really distant, I thought it might have been a very fast, uh, quickly played timpani roll. But uh, no, it turned out to be an organ, which uh, is not too surprising, I suppose. More likely than a timpani roll. Uh, but just from the sound, that's where I thought it was going. I, I don't think I've listened to the song since I recorded the show, which was uh, like a year ago. So um, it, it's nice to get another fresh look at this. Uh, I like the pitch that the vocals are coming in at now. It's it just feels like a very natural progression, like as, as a musician and as a listener of music, this just feels like the natural place that the song should be going. So very comfortable, very enjoyable to listen to. I really love that Gary always finds a way to make the bass interesting, even in a simple song like this, you know, where there's not a lot going on dynamically. He still finds a way to to really carve a space for the bass guitar. And it definitely keeps the song going. You know, it adds uh, some interest without distracting too much. You almost feel it more than you hear it, except that I'm specifically targeting, you know, instruments while I'm I'm doing this. But it's it's always just so magical the way that he found to to integrate the bass into a song. Um, so many bass players would just be tempted to play the roots there or maybe like one or two extra notes. But he actually doesn't quite make a solo instrument out of it, but really fills the spectrum of sound. And I just love that. Such a great bluesy guitar solo. I, I love that. I, I like that it it only wandered kind of when it needed to. You know, it really felt like it just stayed in a, a really nice lane and didn't venture out too far from that, which compared to where it was in the introduction, you had kind of expected something a little more wild. And I like that it was, I guess, more tame. You know, not everything should be wild. I think this was great for a blues song to have a solo like that. Um, nothing really special going on with the drums. They're they're very straightforward. Um, but this is a song that doesn't need that. You know, it doesn't need grandiose drum fills or anything. It just really needs a solid foundation. And that's exactly what you're getting. You're getting some nice accents on the hi-hat from Lee, which are pretty cool. Um, really fit this kind of song well. 
but he's not getting all crazy with drum fills, even in the transitions. You know, he's very laid back on the song, which I think is good. It's just another thing that gives the chance uh, for the guitar to shine a little bit more. I also find that that keyboard part came back again. And now that I'm thinking about it, it is kind of weird because it's not really followed up by anything. It's like it just comes in and it disappears. And I'm not really hearing any more organ than that. So I'm not really sure why it's there. Um, it's kind of too long to just be a transition sound. It should be building to something. And uh, maybe it's just my headphones or maybe it's the mix, but I'm just not hearing any more organ beyond that. So maybe we will. Uh, who knows? We got a ways to go in the song. We're just over halfway. Okay, so I am hearing more of that organ now. I'm glad that I focused on that a little bit more. It's blended in very well. It's it's kind of subtle. I think they could have boosted that in the mix. I do really like the drum mix, though. I could use maybe just a, a, a skosh more kick drum. But apart from that, it sounds really good. I think with a with a good blues like this, that's really a, a foundation or pocket song. It's just good to have a little more push in the chest with the bass drum. Um, just my opinion as an engineer, I probably would have pushed that a little bit. But overall, it sounds really good. Um, it's a great song. It's it's got a great vocal to it, and I just love the exchange. You know, you've got the vocals come in where the vocals breathe, the guitars coming in to fill in, almost as if it's another verse. And then that comes out even, you know, through the guitar playing, we've transitioned musically. Then we go back into the next verse. Like it really just has a good flow to it. Okay, so that was about two minutes long, I think two minutes and two seconds long. And um, yeah, that kind of went a little bit off the rails, I think. Um, it, it definitely surpassed the song. I think if we were going to really beef up the solo like that, I think it kind of overshadows the music, whereas solos a lot of times will overshadow it, but still work within the frame structure of the music. And I think that this was maybe just a little a little crazier for that kind of beat if they would have doubled the beat or changed it, you know, made some kind of difference in the dynamics that would have worked a little bit better for me. Um, I did hear a couple things that reminded me of like tears in my eyes and the magician's birthday a little bit, but um, 
I mean, it was it was well played, but I think it didn't necessarily fit the song that well. So, uh, you know, like I said, you, you could hear a piece of music one day, you can hear it 20 minutes earlier, 20 minutes later, or the next day and have four completely different opinions on what you felt in the song and listening to it right now. Um, this is just what I'm I'm getting out of it. I do feel like that was um, a bit much for that kind of music. I also did find a couple spots where the bass was coming in a little bit late that kind of threw the beat off a little bit for me. Not by much. I mean, just, you know, slightly, but just enough for me to uh, feel off the beat. And I'm a drummer, so I'm going to notice those things. But overall, it was a pretty good song. It was a good vocal. I really liked the vocal and guitar exchange. You know, the way that they just kind of took over for each other was pretty nice. But um, yeah, it was a good song. Um, it's nice to have a simple laid back song sometimes. Like Stealing is is another song that's really uh, a laid back song for the first part of it. And it's nice to just do that. For this, I think I would have liked at least one more part or some other transition to carry that solo through the end. Um, it, 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 yeah, it just, it just felt a little, a little overplayed for this song for me. It would have definitely worked greater in something with maybe a, a, a double tempo from what we've got here, a double beat. Um, but overall the mix was pretty good. Um, I'm glad that there was more organ in it than I thought initially. And it was, it was just kind of quiet in the mix. It wasn't, you know, very, very prominent. So I didn't notice it as much, but overall a good song. Would I listen to it again? Absolutely. I think you know, despite what was going on during the the time of Wonder World, I think Wonder World was still a great album. Um, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say if there's, you know, like people ask me all the time, if I want to get into Rai Heap, what, what album should I listen to first? And I, I'm always tempted to say, just start at the beginning, but recognize that this band has gone through probably more changes than any other band I followed in in the way of sound and style. And they've had so many different members that have influenced things so many different ways. Like if you look at the different singers or, you know, the different keyboard players, how different those albums are. So I always recommend start at the beginning. Um, Wonder World is a good album, but I probably wouldn't say this would, should be your first impression of your eye heap. I think that that um, there was a lot going on, but they still came up with some pretty good music here. And uh, I like the song, you know, despite my feeling of the last couple minutes, I think that overall the song is great. So I hope that you guys enjoyed it and we'll be back for another episode before you know it. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days.